Welcome to this edition of Psychedelic Radio. I'm Christina Thomas, the president and founder of Myself Wellness, and my co-host is Charles Patty. Together, we co-founded the Warriors of Consciousness, a not-for-profit to help people gain access to psychedelic ketamine therapy. Together, we are on our mission to help save and transform lives through this treatment. In this podcast, we'll be pushing boundaries, breaking taboos, and shedding light on the use of psychedelic medicines. We want to share expert knowledge and firsthand accounts of those who've experienced transformative psychic shifts using psychedelics. Thank you, everyone, for journeying with us today. And joining us on this edition of Psychedelic Radio is Patrick L. Schmidt. He is an attorney in Washington, D.C. He received his B.A. and magnum cum laude from Harvard College and a J.D. from Georgetown University and an I.M. I'm sorry, M.I.P.P. from John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. He first examined the history of the Department of Social Relations in his undergraduate honors thesis at Harvard. He then went on to write a book, Harvard with Toxic Pursuit of New Science, The Rise and Fall of the Department of Social Relations. Thank you very much for joining us today, Patrick. Thank you for having me. All right. So I guess the first thing would be like, um, let's let's go ahead and start talking about your new book or or your book that came out. Okay. well, um, I when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, my senior honors thesis, I I wrote about this unusual department that Harvard started in 1946. And some of the professors who started the department were still around. And so I was able to interview them. So in, in addition to my documentary research, I was able to to talk to these uh, some of the some of the most famous social scientists of the 20th century. And it was well received. I had a lot of fun doing it. And then many decades later, um, I decided to to make a book out of it because I had gotten a lot of uh, uh, inquiries about my thesis in the meantime. And it was a topic I enjoyed. So I did a lot more research, went up to the Harvard archives and was able to turn that essay into a book. Amazing. Amazing. Will you give us the Cliff Notes version of your book? (laughs) Sure. Well, this this uh, department, which was called the Department of Social Relations, it, it, it started for two reasons at Harvard. One is in the 19 going back to the 1920s, there was a lot of disagreement, particularly in these young disciplines of psychology, sociology, and cultural anthropology, people, they weren't even sure what the disciplines were. And this fight was particularly tough in uh, psychology. The experimental psychologists like B.F. Skinner, who your listeners may know him, um, he was a very scientifically oriented psychologist. When Freud and Jungian and psychoanalytic thought came into the United States in the late 20s and 30s, and psychologists began to be interested in that, this caused a division in psychology. The people like B.F. Skinner didn't want anything to do with studying the interior mind. They only wanted to study what they could observe. And this made it very difficult for Harvard to have a department where people were fighting like this. Sociology was having similar fights. Cultural anthropology was brand new. Uh, also was not well received in a department that was archaeologically oriented. So you had these problems, and then World War II happened. And in World War II, the government hired a lot of these behavioral scientists to study things like the morale of our enemies. There was a whole division called the Foreign Morale Analysis, Analysis Division in the war effort, and we studied the morale of the Germans, the Japanese. We studied the morale of our own troops. Uh, we studied how can we sell war bonds, more war bonds. Everything was uh, everything was on the table. And all of a sudden, these uh, behavioral scientists became, you know, they were sort of in the back water of things. But now they came to the fore and, and um, they were sort of the Cinderella's at the ball. But more importantly, they were working together without restrictions, like the psychologists were working side by side with anthropologists and with sociologists. So there weren't these departmental distinctions. The The army just wanted answers and they didn't care how you got the answers. We don't care what you call yourself. Just tell us 
the answer. So when the war ended, these professors, many of them from Harvard, were involved in this war effort. They said, well, we should do this in the university too. We don't need these artificial distinctions. So they convinced Harvard to start this interdisciplinary department comprised of sociology, uh, clinical, social psychology, and cultural anthropology. And that department lasted from 1946 to 1972. It had a lot of very famous and infamous uh, faculty members. And uh, we can talk a little bit about some of those, but uh, it, 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 it didn't work, unfortunately. It had some very smart professors who did great work, but they never were able to come up with a new, a new science per se. They really just continued to do sort of the work they had been doing. So you have this huge department that's going on, kind of almost like an under an underground part of the department doing all of these studies. So how does Timothy Leary and um, Robert Alpert really play a role play a role in um, in in what was going on there? Well, um, Timothy Leary came to Harvard in 1959. Uh, Richard Alpert was already there. Uh, Timothy Leary, when he came to Harvard, was a mainstream clinical psychologist. He studied people um, in real life situations, how to help them. He was not an abstract researcher. He wanted to help people. He he was his interest was in personality psychology, and the first summer after he arrived at Harvard, he went to Mexico and he tried the magic mushroom for the first time. Yeah. And, and this was a revelation to him. He, he said this was a religious experience. He was convinced this was a future of psychology and how to help mankind. We agree so, with that statement. Yeah, 100 <laughs> percent. Yeah. I mean, he, he just said, look, uh, there's so many ways this can help mankind. So when he got back to Harvard that fall, he started three different research projects based on psilocybin and he was able to get it was impractical to give the mushroom to people in experiments so he was able to get the synthesized uh synthetic drug from sandos the drug company mm -hmm. um he just wrote a letter on harvard stationery to sandos and said hey i can i get some of the psilocybin for research and they they sent him back a huge supply just without that was it they just said well <laughs> tell us how it goes you know imagine if that worked these days <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it was quite something so he that actually the, the fact that he had that huge supply led to him being sort of the guru that he was because he could sort of give out the psilocybin to not only the the the, the subjects of the research but he was giving it to famous people that he was trying to bring into his circle, the beatnik generation, uh, uh, um, Aldous Huxley, uh, who famously tried mescaline and wrote about it in the doors of perception. Um, so he started this research at Harvard. It became quite controversial quite quickly because it was pretty loose uh, research. He, he didn't have a lot of uh, controls. He basically was giving the psilocybin to, in many cases, students undergraduates, graduate students, and others. And we just asked them to write about their experience. So there was no controls. It was not the sort of research we think about today. And also there were some uh, rumors about um, some students were ha having a bad experience, had to go to the hospital. So all of a sudden Harvard got very concerned about this and they looked, started looking into it. Uh, the, the faculty had a huge fight um, wanted to sort of shut it down or at least have it controlled by doctors because Timothy Leary was not a, a, a medical doctor. Um, and so Timothy Leary and then Richard Alpert, who later became famous in his own right as Ram Das in, in the 60s as a spiritual leader, um, uh, Alpert joined Leary in, in this. They were, they considered themselves a, a, a Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, that's the way they look, they saw themselves, you know, the mischievous, you know, uh, um, uh, companions and duo. Um, so, but their argument to the Harvard was, well, this is academic freedom. You know, we have the right to do the research we want. And Harvard does take academic freedom very seriously. Um, <clears throat> so they were having these arguments and these fights had dragged on for two years. Meanwhile, there's a lot of drug use at Harvard, all sorts of drugs, not just psilocybin 
Um, so this is becoming a bigger and bigger concern for Harvard and the authorities. And finally, they said, well, you can't use undergraduates, students in your research anymore. That We draw the line there. And Leary said, OK, but Alpert broke that rule. He gave the psilocybin not an experiment. He just gave it to a friend of his who was an undergraduate. Um, and Harvard found out about this and fired Alpert. Wow. They did not fire Leary. Leary just stopped showing up to classes. <laughs> and of course, his 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 catchphrase was uh, turn on, uh, tune in and drop out. And yeah. so he, he did sort of just drop out. He just didn't show up anymore for, for his classes. So they just took his name off the payroll. And that was a launch pad for Timothy Leary and the counterculture, the drug culture of the 60s. He um, And I, I, I would also say that this incident at Harvard got in the New York Times. This controversy got in the New York Times. It was written about in Life magazine, Saturday Evening Post, about five other national magazines. So this was the first time that the general public in the United States became aware of these drugs and what was going on on the campuses. So it was really the launch pad in a couple of different ways, not just for Leary personally, but also it sort of ushered in the drug culture. I, I'm not saying it caused it, but it certainly publicized it. And in that sense was the launch pad. And um, so this incident in this department was uh, had quite a cultural significance for the United States and the world. So do, you, do you do you feel that the reason, <clears throat> pardon me, the the reason that this didn't go through accordingly, or or maybe they didn't turn the kind of results, or or at least get the positive kind of spotlight on this, was because it was not done in a clinical sense, and it was more just administered by you know, a couple of guys who, who weren't technically doctors and, you know, and then they just started kind of partying with their friends with it. Yeah, that was a big part of the problem. And, and um, uh, certainly at, at Harvard and it left them open to, to criticism. I mean, it was hard to argue with that. Uh, yeah. Leary, in addition to saying, arguing our academic freedom, he said, well, Harvard is the right place for this research because William James the, the 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 father of American psychology in many ways and revered professor at Harvard, he was experimenting with nitrous oxide, you know, back really? in the, the 1890s and, 19, you know, so, and he was taking nitrous oxide and then writing about it. So Larry was saying, hey, I'm, I'm in the, in the lineage of uh, famous William James, you know, <laughs> um, but and beyond Harvard, the the sort of the black eye that the psychedelic drugs got because of this this loose research, it it set back. I mean, on the one hand, you got to give Timothy Leary credit because he identified the potential for psilocybin. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Yep. He didn't go about it in the right way, methodology, methodology, so on and so forth. And also, but it, it set back research because it gave such a stigma. That's what I was just going to ask you. And is, is that why you think it took so is, long yeah. for now? Is, is, that when, is, is that when Nixon came in? and Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and Nixon, Nixon had a thing about Timothy Leary. He called him the most dangerous man in America. <laughs> oh, no. Based on his, his, his message, his drug use. And in 1971, Nixon signed into law uh, the uh, Controlled Substances Act. Yeah. Which banned research, any research in psychedelic drugs. It didn't matter. You could be at a medical school or whatever. Banned all of it. So a lot of people believe that's what set back the research until in recent years. It's it's picked back up, and now, I mean, and, and ironically, Harvard has started doing research again in psilocybin. I was gonna say it's a, it's almost like it came a, it came full turn, but I guess now in the eyes of everybody, they're doing it properly with medical, yeah. you know, it's medical staff medical setting. clinical setting, and yeah, and yeah. it basically seems like everything kind of came full circle, and it, and they were on to something, and and now it's you know it's just being done in a different way where it's it's safer and it's gonna you know collect clinical data. Yeah, I mean it's the it's a center for the neuroscience of psychedelics. It's okay. being done by uh. A uh, professor at the Harvard Medical School, 
And at it's being done physically at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Amazing. And so there's no FDA approval yet for this therapy that they're, they're trying. But uh, in other universities, Johns Hopkins, Berkeley, uh, New York University, they're doing you know similar types of study and and with promising results for things like uh, PTSD, you know, anxiety, all sorts of things. And Michael Pollan has a wonderful documentary out, uh, how, how to Change Your Mind, I think is the title, mm-hmm. um, where he, he he dives into this um, uh, um, research that's going on. So it's getting you know very you know promising results. So Timothy Leary would be looking at all this and having a good laugh that Harvard has come around to to doing the research, you know? Yeah, for sure. We just actually, uh, we just uh, did a podcast with uh, Dr. Albert Rom- Albert Garcia Romeo, Romeo, and he is a doc, he's doing clinical work with psilocybin out of John Hopkins University uh, for substance abuse issues and, and addiction to nicotine and things to that effect. And, uh, you know, it's like, I, I was telling him, you know, I think it's, I, I really appreciate the work that's being done because psychedelic medicines actually saved my life. Psilocybin, DMT, MDMA, ketamine, uh, got me off of a lifetime of substance abuse and alcohol issues that I was self-medicating my own underlying mm-hmm. things. And so, you know, I think going main, you know, I, I think that with, with colleges and universities with like the likes of john hopkins university and harvard and all of this actually getting into this clinical work it's really going to change the the minds of a lot of people that had been having a negative viewpoint on these compounds just because you know it's like i've been trying to tell people for years that i got sober from taking psychedelics and everybody thought i was nuts but the truth is is that you know like with all of this amazing work that's coming out now i think there's going to be a huge shift in the way that you know these medicines are perceived yeah, no, absolutely. It's a turning point. Um, and and once, if they continue to get promising results and eventually get, you know, FDA approval for this, you know, ther- therapy. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it. Is It'll be a complete, a complete change. I mean, just amazing. Yeah, I don't think they'll be handing out bottles of psilocybin. <laughs> the whole no, no, it'll still be, you know, controlled and uh, yeah. probably under medical supervision. And all, yes, all that it will stuff. be. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's quite a step forward. Um, so while reviewing your book, you know, I saw that they were one of the, um, I don't know, test groups that they were giving the psilocybin to was um, a religious group. And to see if they would have religious experience. Did you come across if those people did have religious experience, if they changed their religious point of view? <laughs> well, of that? again, that was a pretty loose uh, study. He went to um, a, a seminary. So these were all students who were studying to become, you know, uh, doctors of divinity. And he would give them the psilocybin and in a very relaxed setting. And the the hope was it would induce some sort of religious uh, experience. And, you know, they had a reaction to psilocybin, but there was, I, I didn't see any, I didn't come across any uh, evidence, anything written, even by Larry himself, that said that, uh, you know, the, these these people had a religious experience, you know. I, I, def- I most definitely did. I, I like most definitely. I'm not a religious person. I'm a very spiritual person, but boy, my eyes were opened and it completely changed my life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I just don't know in that particular experiment, you know, what, what happened, but, uh, um, and, and Larry himself described what described it for himself as a religious experience. You know? Do you know if you heard anything about that, about like a, a thought of using these compounds for prison reform? Well, actually, that was one of the other studies that Timothy okay. Leary did. Okay. He went into the Concord uh, prison and was giving psilocybin to uh, uh, convicts in the hope that it would reduce the rate of recidivism. Mm-hmm. And again, he, he he claimed to have very positive results. Um, I mean, he claimed something like 80 percent. I mean, it was some huge number. Uh, but again, it was so loosely done that it's really hard to know, you know, how accurate any of that was. But again, you know, Timothy Leary kind of had the, 
you know, had like uh, the right idea in the sense of, well, maybe this could help people in that situation. Um, I, I'm a huge believer in that. I know that they're actually using ayahuasca in Brazil and giving it to inmates before they're released and the return rate is is going down exponentially. I'm actually trying to put together a team of people here in the States to get ketamine in the prisons because I think that, you know, it, it's doing basically what all of these other psychedelic compounds are doing for people and, you know, having these psycho spiritual experiences or religious experiences. And the fact that it is FDA approved and it's been FDA approved since 1970, I think that it might actually be an easier sell point on something like that than trying to get magic mushrooms or, or uh, you know, LSD or whatever compounds into these kind of facilities these days. Yeah. Or even yeah. as a part of an aftercare program or something like that, you know, like as a part of like a early release or, or, um, you know, parole or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, th there's so many possibilities. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm as a historian, I'm, I'm looking back at what was going on in the sixties. I'm not an expert necessarily on all the things that are going on now, other yeah. than, you know, there, there's a lot going on and it's getting very positive, uh, you know, very positive results so far. For sure. It's exciting stuff. Yeah, no, I think it's just really amazing that all of this was kind of, it was going on before and then all got shut down. But now here we are again, really digging in deep to, to, you know, what our, our history was trying to tell us. And these researchers were trying to tell us before, like it's, it's been here the whole time, <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, I mean, it's a, it's a shame that the, the research got shut down for for so long we could that be that much further you know down the road but anyway it's 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 great that it is picking back up again so so i i was when i was looking into um like and we were actually going through your your book together and i think there there's a part about them actually these guys were working with the unabomber and doing experiments on them mm -hmm. was it not oh. Yeah, that was a different professor, but in the same department. Oh, it's a different professor. Okay, yeah. I followed. That that professor was his name was Henry Murray. Okay, and he was um, back in the twenties and thirties. He had been the main uh, conduit for bringing in uh, psychoanalytic thought from Europe into the American universities, and he was, uh, you know, really maligned for that. I mean, the, the the existing psychologists didn't want to have anything to do with it. They thought it was mysticism and a cult. And he had a he had a, had a really difficult time. He, he it, Harvard wouldn't give him tenure. They were trying to get rid of him. Uh, the other psychologists, not Harvard necessarily. And then during World War II, he became the chief psychologist for the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was the precursor to the CIA. Really. And his specialty was determining who would make a good spy, who could withstand interrogation. And the flip side of that, how do you break the spies that we capture? How do you put them under so much stress that they'll give up their secrets? This was his specialty in World War II. Well, now fast forward to the late 1950s, and he was still doing that research at Harvard, but now he was doing the research on undergraduates, mm -hmm. putting them in these stressful situations to see if he could break them down. And one of those students was a 17-year-old Harvard undergraduate uh, named Theodore Kaczynski, who was a very shy, brilliant kid. He, he, got, he got accepted at Harvard when he was 16. Brilliant, but very socially you know, awkward, a, you know, um, shy, aloof and all of that. Um, and for three years, uh, Murray did this very uh, intense, traumatizing experiment on Kaczynski. It was voluntary. And, and actually, when he was captured, his lawyer said, well, Ted, why did you, if it was so awful, why did you keep going back? And he said, well, I wanted to show them that they, that I could take it. No. You know, or like, like listening to this conversation, it makes my mind go to 
like the okay so so leary and ramdas they were using psilocybin and this was psychedelics and then you've got this other professor and he's doing this and then all of a sudden it comes out that you know this the oss which turned into the cia i believe that you said some something along those lines it almost sounds like mk ultra kind of esque <laughs> you, you know yeah well mk ultra was different in the sense that that was an involuntary pro people didn't know they were getting sprayed with lsd you know they, they were unsuspecting they didn't volunteer for anything okay right? yeah. so that was a really uh, they were both awful but the mk yeah. ultra was really bad yeah <laughs> they were just they were just spraying lsd at people and and uh seeing what would happen um and uh so that was that was a different experiment definitely um had the link with with the cia i'm not sure whether henry murray if he was linked to the mk ultra it's possible i didn't see that in my research but I, again i was focused more on the what he was doing sort of officially at harvard um but yeah i mean it definitely um makes you think of mk ultra uh although there are important distinctions between the two experiments for yeah, sure. it totally went there in my mind too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's amazing what the the government was, or the government, the the these professors were getting away with. I mean, the the thing with Ted Kaczynski is they they Henry Murray lied to Ted Kaczynski's mother to get her consent for the experiment. Wow! Because he was only seventeen, so he had to get consent of the mother. But he didn't explain to the mother what the experiment was all about. He just said, we're doing this experiment to learn about human behavior and ways that might help people, uh, you know, in the future. Something very vague, okay? And the mother, sadly, said, gee, uh, you know, Teddy has such problems, social problems. I thought these nice professors at Harvard might help him. That, that was her quote. And of course, nothing was further from the truth. They weren't interested in helping Ted Kaczynski. They just put him through hell. Now, what, whether that created the Unabomber, there's a lot, there are people that's, that try to say that this caused him. To I was just going to ask, I was uh, going to ask, do you think there's a link? Well, some people claim there is. I'm not claiming there is. And even his own brother who turned him in does not claim that Harvard made the Unabomber. It, they he said they certainly traumatized him and put him through hell um but he, he even he stopped short of sort of, of saying that Harvard created the the Unabomber um Kaczynski himself says it was the worst experience of his life um but we'll never really know because all the files are sealed at Harvard and unless Kaczynski himself wants to talk about it more uh I don't think we'll ever know much more about it Wow. Super interesting. Very interesting stuff. <laughs> I like I like going down the rabbit hole sometimes. <laughs> I think we all do. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, no, because I mean we're we learn one story and sometimes it's not always that story that, that we're learning and there's more that we were never even told. Yeah. So, and then you start putting the puzzle pieces yeah. together and it all starts to make sense. Well, thank you for joining us today on this edition of Psychedelic Radio. You can download our past episodes of our program by going to CannabisRadio.com or by subscribing to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. To learn more about the Warriors of Consciousness, please visit us on social media and go to the WOCFund.org and watch the videos. And if nobody's told you that they love you lately, we, we do. do. The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited.